Okay, today I'd like to describe using nuclear magnetic resonance, NMR spectroscopy, to measure the diffusion coefficient or coefficients in a liquid. And the example I'm going to use today is a very simple one, which would just be a small amount of chloroform in deuterated acetone. And the reason I'll specifically talk about deuterated acetone is in most NMR experiments, it's a deuterated solvent we use so that we can lock the magnetic field and not have it drift during the course of the experiment. Now the common method in NMR for doing this, we usually do it on protons, so it's usually 1H NMR, and we use pulse field gradients spin echo method NMR. And I'm going to break this down piece by piece qualitatively so we can get us a sense for what this experiment would be like. I'm going to start by the simplest thing, which is just proton NMR. So if I told you to run a proton NMR spectrum of this sample, the most common thing you would do is to pulse it typically 90 degrees, detect what you pulse, and so this is in the time domain. This is called the free induction decay. And then you do a Fourier transform of that to, to put it into the frequency domain. And we usually plot it in parts per million of the field from about zero to 10 parts per million of the field, which is its chemical shift. And what we would see for this sample is a peak for chloroform and a peak for acetone. Now to describe this, and this would be about 8 ppm, and this would be about 2 ppm. If we looked in very fine detail at this peak, we would actually see that it's a pentet. And the reason it's a pentet is because this is the small amount of D5 acetone that's in that's in deuterated D6 acetone, and that one proton on the acetone on one of the methyls is split by the deuteriums into a pentet, if we looked at the fine structure. If we looked at the fine structure of this, we would actually see a large peak, and then there would be two small peaks on either side of it, which are known as carbon satellites. This is due to the small amount of C13 chloroform that's at about 1% in there. So that, did, that describes some of the fine structure of what you would see for this sample. Now let's go on and introduce the idea of a spin echo. So what a spin echo um, does is it refocuses the magnetization. And it can be used in and of itself to measure, most commonly, the transverse relaxation time called T2. And so let's briefly describe this. So again, if we start with a 90 degree pulse, but after some time, we now pulse again, but for twice the duration, a 180 degree pulse. Um, what we'll see is, is that that magnetization will build up into an echo after the same amount of time tau we did here. So the total length of time here being basically two tau. Uh, neglecting the time of the 180-degree yeah, pulse. And so the signal after this point, if we start detecting at this later time, is again the free induction decay. And we do the same type of thing, which is we take a Fourier transform of that, and we'll get our standard two peaks for chloroform and for acetone. Now, the interesting thing is if we vary, if we make this tau longer and longer, so if we make it greater values tau here, these peaks get smaller and smaller. And so the reason they do that is because longer and longer times are you're allowing this to dephase in the transverse plane in a way that, that transversely relaxes the sample. So if we plotted this, you would see as a function of this time versus the signal, in this case it's the signal at two theta, or at two tau, decreases exponentially. And that goes as time versus this transverse relaxation time T2. And at the end of this, I'll show you a few websites where you can get more information. So a common spin echo is used to measure the T2 relaxation 
within a sample by varying this tau constant and watching the signal amplitude at through tau decrease smaller and smaller. And that signal, which you could measure directly off the free induction decay, but is not very common, it's typically measured from the Fourier transform by either measuring the peak height, the amplitude or the height of that peak and how it decreases, or by integrating over a specific area here and taking the area, the integrated area, and how it decreases. Both are directly proportional to the signal, the direct signal at 2 tau. The first, using the height, assumes that the width of these peaks remains constant throughout the experiment. The integrated area is a more accurate way to do this. Okay, so that introduces in a, a general thought. Now let's add our pulse field gradients. And this is what is going to allow us to switch from looking at the transverse relaxation to looking at a diffusion coefficient. So now, if this is the proton channel here, we, we can have a gradient channel. And on that channel, we can pulse a gradient and we typically do it right after these RF pulses. And we can adjust the time of that gradient, and that's small delta, and these are usually the same exact, so small delta. And we can make the amplitude smaller or bigger of these. So we can change the amplitude of those, and then the time between these we'll call big delta. So what these gradients do is um, basically this first gradient dephases the magnetization and this one rephases it. And if the molecules have diffused in that time big delta, then it's not able to rephase the magnetization and again the, the peak intensity decreases upon this echo. So this echo at, at signal at 2 tau gets smaller and smaller. And the distance that it moves is sensitive to how much gradient strength you have on it. So if you make a larger and larger gradient, then it takes less of a distance to cause it not to be able to phase and then, or to dephase it and then rephase it during that time. So what we can do is adjust the gradient strength here and again watch the same signal amplitudes decrease. So Again, we're plotting the signal to tau, but now we're going to plot it versus the gradient squared, and we'll see that it decreases. Now, what dictates this decay here is it's dependent on the diffusion coefficient, the gyromagnetic ratio in this case of protons, we already said it's the gradient squared, it's the delta squared, large delta minus delta. And that dictates the rate. Now again, the small delta is the length of our gradient pulse. Large delta is the, the time between the two, gra to two gradients. So these are both NMR parameters that we set during the NMR experiment. This is the gyromagnetic ratio, and it is a constant of the nucleus that you're looking at. In this case, it's typically proton, and again, I'll show you where you can find those values. So these are all constants, so we can get out what the diffusion coefficient is for our sample. Now, we typically linearize this um, and this would be to normalize it over the signal, the initial signal. So how do we linearize this? We'll linearize this by taking the ln, the signal, so I'm writing all my squared terms, delta minus, and then this is plus, we can write it this way, 
for simplicity's sake. Now usually we take the ln of s0 over to this side. That way when we plot ln of s2, which is again our height or our integrated signal versus the gradient squared, it'll be linear. Where it crosses the y-axis here, if we bring this over, it'll be plus ln of s0. So this will be ln of the initial sig uh, signal. And then the slope will be minus d gamma squared delta squared big delta minus here. Again, the gyromagnetic ratio big and small delta are constants, so we can get out what the diffusion coefficient is. I hope this helps in a general explanation of using proton pulse field gradient spin echoes, and I briefly want to give you a few websites you can go to for more information. And so, what I pulled up here, the first I want to describe to you is, um, is a free book, an online book called The Basics of NMR. It's completely online at www.cis.rit.edu, HT Books NMR. When you open that, it has a lot of the basic spin physics and goes through um, what T1 processes and what I was just describing T2 processes here. It also goes through basic uh, pulse sequences, including spin echo, sequence here and some practical ideas in advance that introduce the diffusion and the equation we were just talking about. If you do a simple Google search on spin echo one of the first things that come up is the wiki page and again this gives a very nice example here of showing the dephasing, showing how 180 refocuses that and how the echo can be used. And down below it even shows you as you increase the echo time, you know, how this exponentially decays. The, there are several things on NMR diffusion uh, when you pull it up that give fairly good explanations on this, um, including several articles. This diffusion NMR spectro uh, spectroscopy is a very good article. Um, the wiki for diffusion NMR describe some of the basics. And then another one I like is the manual for Bruker's diffusion in NMR. Gives a very nice example. And finally there's an NMR diffusion homepage again where they describe all the parameters that we just talked about. The gyromagnetic ratio, if you do a search again, there's a good Wikipedia page that gives the value. In this case we typically use proton and the values are given here. Finally, if you're in my class, I've provided a lot of uh, handout information that better describes this. I hope this helps give you a basic introduction to pulse field gradient spin echo NMR. Thank you. Okay.